Hello, how are you doing? So in the past week, I received some bad personal news and it's left me feeling a bit depressed and reflective. And on Saturday, it was Bookshop Day, uh, which is a campaign trying to get people to go out to bookshops and buy books. And I thought, well, this is something I obviously should be doing uh, since I love books, uh, even though I definitely don't need more books on my bookshelves because I have plenty to, to read. But I, I went to Daunt Bookshops, uh, the, the one near Baker Street. There's a few different Daunt Bookshops around uh, London. And uh, the, the one near Baker Street is so beautiful. There's this just big open uh, space with uh, shelves on two different levels that you can see at the same time. It, it mainly specializes in sort of travel writing and travel books, but uh, but it has a lot of other books as well and a, a lot of fiction. And, uh, and so I had such a pleasure just looking around the bookshelves and, you know, perusing all the books. And it reminded me like what a uh, thing to lift my spirits it is to, to go to a bookshop and just browse and look at all these these different books and uh, and I ended up buying uh, some books and uh, then I have some other books that publishers have kindly sent me so I thought I'd go through this stack and share them with you um, to tell you books that I'm interested in reading and uh, to see if you've read any of these. I'd, I'd love to know if you have and would recommend any of them in the comments below. Uh, or if you're really interested in reading any of these now, please let me know about those in the comments below as well. Uh, so a, the book I bought from uh, Dump Books is uh, called Old Lady Vo Voice, uh, which is one word in this title. And it's by Elise Victoria. And it's translated uh, by Charlotte Whittle, um, translated from the Spanish and it's about a nine-year-old girl whose uh, mother becomes seriously ill in the hospital and uh, while she's in the hospital um, the, the girl goes to stay with her grandmother and uh, and starts having these conversations with her grandmother and uh, and is sort of reflecting on her uh, take on the world um, from that that position and it says on the back it's described as a uh, it reimagines childhood through the eyes of its one-of-a-kind hilarious and endearing narrator a nine-year-old who can swear like a sailor but thinks like a novelist and to capture that kind of voice in fiction I think is a really tricky thing to pull off I mean it's often said you know how difficult it is to write from the point of view of a child in in a novel because uh, not to not instill in that child you know everything that the novelist knows but then to not make it too twee and like overly sentimentalized I think is a difficult thing but I've, I've heard really good things about this novel which was just published recently by and other stories um, here in the UK and uh, and so yeah I, I really keen to try it out and I was just drawn to it and um, especially how the narrator's voice is described as like quite funny as well as endearing um, so yeah I'm looking forward to this and also I got the new uh, recently translated book by or latest recently translated book by Annie Ernaux uh, called Exteriors and uh, translated I think this is also translated by uh, yeah by Tanya Leslie who's also translated a number of uh, Annie Ernaux's books and uh, I'm particularly drawn to this most recent one because I just read recently uh, her uh, her book called Simple Passion and I talked about it quite extensively in a, in a video recently and I love her writing and what really draws me to this is that it's um, a number of journal entries of Erno's um, written over many years and uh, they're more just sort of observations about uh, ordinary things that happen in the sort of margins of life, you know, rather than quite often Annie Erno writes about like big life events or big uh, relationships, uh, impactful relationships she's had over the course of her life, whether with family members or with uh, people she's had romantic relationships with. And, and this is just more about the extraneous details of life and what that says about our life and is capturing this, this sense of uh, living on the outskirts of, of Paris um, in her life. And, and I think that's such a like interesting original take. Um, and so I'm, I'm keen to see how Erno pulls that off. There's also the big new novel Crossroads by Jonathan Franzen. It's 
it's almost 600 pages long. Uh, lots of people have been talking about this and discussing this because a new Jonathan Franzen novel is always quite a big event. Uh, he's a writer that I've always appreciated his books in the past without like wholly loving him as much as some people do love this author's writing, and uh, so I am very keen to read this. Um, it's the first part in a trilogy, and it follows a family called the Hildebrandt family, I think, um, who are all the members of this family are at a crossroads of their life where uh, they're making sort of big decisions. And uh, yeah, it takes place in the early 1970s. And uh, so it also involves the politics of the time. And I think how that is impacting uh, the different members of this family and their decisions they make in sort of steering the big life decisions that they want to make. And so, um, yeah, I'm really keen to get to this, but it's yeah quite a big book. So I'm not sure when I'm going to read it, but uh, maybe sooner than later, who knows? <laughs> There's also Ruth Ozeki's new novel, The Book of Form and Emptiness, uh, which a lot of people have been discussing as well. Um, another quite big book. Um, it's almost 550 pages long, and uh, I've read uh, her novel A Tale for the Time Being, and I loved that book as, as many people did, but I've not read anything else by her, um, so I am quite keen to get to this. It sounds like Quite a sweet sentimental story on the surface, but her writing is like quite philosophical and thoughtful in a lot of ways. And so I'm sure she incorporates a lot of that into this. Um, it's it's about a boy whose um, father died a year ago and, and he starts to hear voices coming from different inanimate objects. And then it's him trying to deal with that. I mean, some of the voices are quite friendly and, and nice and other voices are a bit threatening and um, difficult to deal with and in order to try to escape this he goes to a library where uh, all the objects know to speak in hushed tones because it's a library um, and he uh, gets to acquainted there with um, some people that uh, pass through the library, but also some of the objects in the library and uh, and a book in the library that starts speaking to him. So yeah, it, it does sound quite like sentimental on the surface of it. But like I said, I think there's probably a lot more deep things uh, to this novel as, as well. Then I have a couple of novels, uh, which coincidentally, both of them deal with uh, individuals who are reconciling their relationship with their, their parents in Japan. Uh, so the first is called A Single Rose by uh, Muriel Barbary, and it's translated by Alison Anderson. Uh, I don't believe she's any relation of mine, but um, yeah, this is translated from the French. It has an incredible cover. Um, the, the cover is completely flat, but I love this optical illusion that makes it feel like this this red circle, swirling circle, is sort of beneath the, the cover. Um, I, I really like that. It's about a woman whose father dies, um, even though she never knew him, and she returns to Kyoto uh, to hear the reading of his will. And uh, there she discovers things about his past and his life and the um, what he did in his life that she never realized um, he did and uh, and also sort of coming to terms with what she wants to do in her own life and yeah I've heard really good things about this novel as well so quite keen to get to it and there is Dream Time by Venetia Welby um, which has quite a cool cover um, although I find it quite difficult to, to read the the title of this on that because of the font of the uh, the title that they've used and I it's it's quite cool but uh, yeah it's it's a bit difficult to to read so this is a novel about a woman um, living in America I believe uh, who it's set sort of in the near future during a uh, sort of climate meltdown and international travel is increasingly becoming not available to people and this one realizes that it might be the last chance for her to physically see her father um, who's working on a U.S. air base in Okinawa and uh, so she travels to Okinawa to uh, reconnect with him and so it gets into their relationship with each other but then also the the past of this island and also about environmental change and and collapse um, that that we're experiencing so it sounds like quite a powerful novel. Percival Everett by Virgil Russell, uh, though the novel is actually written by the author Percival Everett. And so it's, it's a kind of tricksy novel that plays with the nature of narrative itself and who gets to tell 
Haiku's stories. And uh, so this novel was first published in 2013. Um, it's just been republished by Influx Press, um, who's been republishing a number of Percival Everett's uh, books and uh, is going to be publishing their, their new book in uh, 2012. Wait, 20. 12? I don't, I don't know what year it is anymore. Uh, 2022, uh, next year. Uh, and anyway, yeah, so um, this sort of, yeah, plays upon the, the nature of narrative about a, a man that goes to visit his aging father in a nursing home. And uh, there tries to tell the, the story of his life and or to write the, the story that he thinks his father would be writing in a novel or is his father writing a novel about the the story of his son's life and yeah it, it plays upon narrative in in that kind of way um sort of similar i think to like the autobiography of alice b tokus um by gertrude stein um so yeah about the nature of of what is the the stories we tell each other and what are the the stories that we're told and how does that kind of build upon each other and i think i think it's really interesting i'm um, exploring these questions of of narrative and and what's truth and what's fiction and um so yeah i'm quite keen to see how he explores that in this book these great athenians by valentine carter um, it's quite a beautifully produced book um, as well as the inside which i'll show you and these are uh retellings of Homer's Odyssey, but from the perspective of some of the more, well, some of the central, but also some of the more marginal female characters in uh, the, the book, which uh, don't really get their own voice. And of course, there's been lots of this fictional retelling in uh, recent fiction, uh, like Circe by Madeline Miller, um, and Circe is included in, in this list of women. Um, but I quite like how she seems to have structured it. Um, so writing it in the kind of poetic um, narrative style uh, that Homer did in, in his book and sort of takes as it as uh, the basis of sort of unpicking what Homer wrote and then rewriting it her herself or reweaving it herself and weaving these stories together and i quite like how the pages have these kind of faded things on the edge of it to make it seem like an old text and so it's sort of playing upon it that way and each section and each woman woman's section um is in a different color and so yeah i just really like how it's all laid out and produced in that way and um and yeah and i think they're can be more from these retellings, even though we've got quite a lot of them already. Hurdy Gurdy by Christopher Wilson. I don't know why, whenever I pronounce this title in my head, I always pronounce it Hurdy Gurdy, <laughs> which is ridiculous. But anyway, uh, I've been, this is the paperback of this novel, um, which just came out recently. And uh, I remember when this came out in hardback and I was really keen to, to read it. I started reading it, but then I got distracted with another book and I just never went back to it. I don't really know why and but I'm really drawn to the subject so it's set in uh, the 14th century during the the Black Plague in uh, Ireland I believe and follows a band of people that are going on a mission and uh, and it's meant to be quite a comic novel and I'm been really enjoying this year reading some books which are set in more ancient history I mean like a thousand plus years ago and uh, you know like I read Matrix by Lauren Groff recently and Cathedral by Ben Hopkins and I really enjoy how those yeah books are re-evaluating that period of history um, through a fictional context and how it's saying giving a new light on history but also saying something about our current times and so yeah I think I'll really enjoy reading this which also has quite a shiny cover. Then I have a couple books of non-fiction um, one very big book and then one uh, quite short book and the first book uh, which also has very shiny cover uh, is God uh, in Anatomy by Francesca Stavrakopolo, uh, quite complicated uh, I'm assuming Greek name and this is looking at the history of God as an entity as 
uh, has been realized throughout history. So looking way back before the Bible was conceived or written, uh, like to 3,000 years ago, uh, to some more ancient civilizations and how God was uh, interpreted and understood through storytelling as a physical being, but then um, in, with the advent of uh, Christianity and uh, so becoming more of a figure uh, as that's seen as as like a single god in monotheistic uh, religions and uh, and so I think it's quite interesting looking at it from that perspective of the history of God as has been interpreted uh, you know throughout time and uh, you know I read uh, a couple years ago a history of the Bible um, which was a, a kind of uh, look at the, the actual text and where the text came from throughout history and how it's been interpreted throughout history. And so I look, I like these books that are looking at religion, you know, not necessarily through um, the perspective of a believer or a non-believer, but just looking at the, the actual history of these concepts and the texts as they've appeared throughout time. Um, and yeah, it's quite a, a lengthy book, but one that I think will be really interesting to, to sink into. Then there is the very short book, uh, Losers by Joshua Cohen, um, which is looking at, uh, takes us its basis, I think, or in, was inspired to look at this concept of losers um, from the way Donald Trump would do use it, this term, um, you know, whenever he wanted to disparage someone he uh, perceived as his enemy, he would describe them as a loser. And uh, so he's looking at, at this, but also at the wider context of why in our society we divide people into winners and losers and and how this is sort of an unhealthy framework within which to, to conceive things, you know, both for our own self-esteem, but also in the way we value and think about our relationships with other people. And, you know, I mean, I can whenever I feel like there are a lot of good things going on in my life, I kind of think of it as, you know, like, oh, I'm winning at life. But then like really, there's like no winning or losing in life really. But but it's interesting how we internalize these these frameworks of um, these these ideas of winning and losing. So yeah, I'm interested to see how he expounds upon these concepts. There's a new collection of short stories called Dark Neighborhood by Vanessa Onwunezi. And uh, this is a, a proof copy um, by Fitzcarraldo Editions. Um, so this is the finished copy in their uh, typical like solid blue color, which they publish all of their fiction in. And this is described as a surreal and haunting journey uh, through a landscape on the edge of time. And there are a number of short stories, obviously, about all different subjects and characters, but which I think sort of move from uh, a kind of physical normal reality into a kind of surreal and uh, hallucinatory kind of experience. And I, I really like it when fiction does that. It's sort of shows this like shift of the world around us like based on our psychology and I've heard so many great things about these short stories um, from a number of people that I'm really keen to get to them and sounds like a really exciting new voice in fiction. The Passing of Forms That We Have Loved by Christopher Boone. This is a novel about a, a man whose father is experiencing a terminal illness and because of this he starts to reevaluate both his present and his past relationships with people and his history of uh, failure and looking at uh, different points in his life when he failed and so like again it's, it would be interesting to, to read this uh, short book Losers and these like concepts of being a failure or a winner and then reevaluating it how people use that as a basis to um, survey their life and um, and uh, criticize their their own life in in this way but uh, but yeah I think it sounds like quite a poignant novel the dust never settles by Katrina licorice Quinn and this is a novel about a woman who returns back to her ancestral home in Lima in Peru uh, to uh, sell it and uh, but 
then when she goes there, she starts to become reacquainted with uh, her family's history and past, and also the, the history of Peru, and is reckoning with these things. I think there are some slightly supernatural elements to it in, in the way the sort of uh, past is haunting the present. And uh, yeah, it sounds like quite a powerful read. The Spirit Engineer by A.J. West. Uh, I think this sounds like a great book to read around Halloween. Uh, it takes place in Belfast in 1914, uh, two years after the sinking of the Titanic, and how lots of people in society have become obsessed with spiritualism and having seances and trying to rouse the dead. And it's about a man that is a skeptic um, that goes to one of these seances, but then he starts to hear voices. And it's about whether the, he's actually hearing voices or if this is like a prank that's been like manufactured um, to, to mess with him and he's a unreliable narrative narrator so it's whether we can really trust his perspective uh, or not and uh, so yeah this um, this sort of my copy came with this fun sort of warning uh, that early readers of this book have uh, started to experience strange happenings in their vo their lives um, because of it of reading certain passages to do with seances um, which is a fun sort of extra narrative like trick I think to try to draw you into the atmosphere of this kind of spooky read. And finally there's a book which just sounded so whimsical I, I couldn't resist being drawn to it uh, which is called The Cat Who Saved Books by Sosuke Natsukawa and this is a book about a, a boy whose grandfather uh, owns a secondhand bookshop um, which he grew up in and loved perusing all of the, the books uh, but after his grandfather dies it seems like the secondhand bookshop must close down uh, until he encounters a talking cat who tries to convince him to rescue books that have been imprisoned and forgotten and uh, so I mean is there any other like concept for a book that is so targeted for book lovers that it's a book all about about books and love of books but also about cats and so yeah I feel like it's it's just so like whimsical and, and fun sounding but also probably quite touching and moving um, as well and so uh, yeah I was just I'm just sort of whimsically drawn to to this book so those are all the books I'm going to talk about. Like I said, um, yeah, let me know in the comments below uh, if you've read any of these books and what you think about them, what you would suggest I prioritize reading, um, or if you're interested in reading any of these books as well. Uh, sorry, I feel like I've been a bit more, I don't know, serious and not as perky as I usually am in my videos. But yeah, I've been yeah, just trying to deal with this news. And um, yeah, and so it's sort of brought me down a little bit. But uh, I hope you're doing well and reading good things. And I'll speak to you again soon. Bye bye.